Hello all and welcome to Stingray Toms Florida and another dip into the archive. Today I'm taking a look at one of Florida's most interesting attractions, which has been closed for over 30 years. Known as Six Gun Territory, it was arguably Florida's first theme park and at its opening was the only attraction in the state to be a recreation of a frontier town in America's Old West. So join me as I take a look at this fascinating attraction, as well as the modern-day charity that hosts regular events that honor Six Gun's legacy. Enjoy! Six Gun Territory opened in 1963 in Silver Springs, near the Silver Springs Group of Attractions. This can be confusing for attractions such as Ross Allen's Reptile Institute, Tommy Bartlett's Deer Ranch, and the Prince of Peace Memorial were all directly connected to the main attraction, Silver Springs. Six Gun Territory was located nearby, within the area called Silver Springs, but it was a separate attraction from the rest. For the story of the development of Silver Springs and its connected attractions, please check out this video. It might seem odd to have a western-themed attraction in the middle of Florida, but America's Wild West was more popular in the early 1960s than at any other time. There were 12 western dramas on TV when Six Gun opened, including Bonanza and Gunsmoke, two of the country's most popular and longest-running shows ever. And How the West Was Won ended up being the second-highest-grossing movie that same year. It's fitting to mention TV and film dramatizations of the Wild West when talking about Six Gun, because the park was much more about gunfighting fantasy rather than reality. The idea was so popular that several other Wild West parks developed around the country, and there were even a couple of parks in Florida that had western areas, including Florida Land near Sarasota, whose western town opened a year after Six Gun territory and looked remarkably similar. Nearly a decade later, Frontierland in the Magic Kingdom also opened, though it didn't feature all the exciting entertainment that was found at Six Gun. Six Gun territory was extremely successful throughout the 60s, benefiting from the popularity of its theme and its proximity to Silver Springs. With the two attractions so close to each other, the area was one of the most popular tourist destinations in the state. Six Gun's format was simple, like most of its contemporary attractions. From the parking lot, visitors could take two different transportation modes to reach the park. One was a traditional narrow-gauge railway, departing from the attractive Southern Railway Station, located near the Territory's mountains. The other was the cable car ride, which lifted visitors over the pine trees. Once at the park, there were two main areas, the town of Six Gun Territory and the rides area. The rides area had a good variety of attractions that were basically the same that would be available at carnivals and fairs, such as a wild mouse style roller coaster, carousel, fun slide, ferris wheel, whip ride, bumper cars, and a tilt-a-whirl. At the time, there weren't a lot of these rides permanently set up in Florida, as nearly all of Florida's attractions didn't focus on thrill rides, so right there, Six Gun was different. And then there was the Call of the Wild West. On its postcards and in its brochures, it was called both the Ghost Town of the Old West and the Town of Six Gun Territory. It might be obvious, but Ghost Town wasn't exactly the right name for the place. If one ignored the tourists, the Wild West Town was still populated with many performers and other staff, all kitted out in clothing Americans would usually only see on their TV. The town was bustling with activity. The school marm ringing her bell the farrier hammering a horseshoe into shape, and the marshal on his rounds. As can be seen from this town plan, there was quite a lot to see. Note that this plan isn't the scale, but it conveys the sense of place that visitors would get gathering around the courthouse square, dropping by the general store or the ice cream parlor, checking out the entertainment at the palace saloon, or getting their picture taken in the photo spot. The town also included an Indian village with a trading post, 
and visitors would also be able to symbolically cross the border to check out the Mexican border town cantina and market. Of course, while the adult visitors were happy to explore all the buildings and shop for things such as western clothing, trinkets, and unusual foods, the kids were waiting for one thing, the gunfights. These battles between the forces of good and evil took place hourly and could happen in various parts of the town. Sometimes there was a jailbreak at the territorial marshal's office. Sometimes there was an attempted bank robbery. There would even be fistfights that played out, such as this one seen on a postcard in front of the palace saloon. It wasn't unusual for kids to visit the park dressed up in their western outfits, and sometimes they would spontaneously help out the lawmen with their own guns. The fights were certainly the most exciting part of the park for the kids, and even most adults, but the overall feel of six-gun territory was augmented by the other performers. There were regular shows at the Palace Saloon featuring lovely can-can dancers, as well as shows in the Indian camp performed by individuals who were billed as champion ceremonial dancers, and even shows in the Mexican cantina. There were stagecoaches coming and going, and even the Pony Express came through the town. By the way, while Six Gun Territory represented a fictional town, the Pony Express was a real-life mail delivery service. It operated at the start of the U.S. Civil War between April 1860 and October 1861. Visitors to the park said there was always something happening in the town, with enough variety that it would keep a family interested for the better part of a day. One oft-forgotten aspect was the number of TV stars that were featured at the park. They would hang out with the performers, chat with visitors, and sign autographs. One such star was John Bromfield, as can be seen in this press photo. Bromfield played Sheriff Frank Morgan in The Sheriff of Cochise and its spin-off, U.S. Marshal, from 1956 to 1960. In the photo, Morgan's posing in front of the entrance sign with the display locomotive. Other well-known actors that visited the town of Six Gun included Tommy Reddick, who played Jeff Miller in Lassie between 1954 and 57, Tony Dow, who played Wally Cleaver in Leave it to Beaver between 57 and 63, and Tommy Norton, who played Bud Ricks in Flipper between 64 and 67, a show filmed in Miami. If you're old enough, you'll know that none of these were westerns, but there was at least a couple western stars to drop by the attraction. As can be seen from the back of this brochure, two of the most famous actors in a TV western were asked to help promote the attraction. Both Dan Blocker, who played Hoss Cartwright in Bonanza from 1959 until his death in 72, and Lorne Green, who played Hoss's dad, Ben Cartwright, from 1959 to 73, provided celebrity endorsements. I'm not sure if Lorne Green did any appearances at Six Gun, but Dan Blocker did. If you ever visited Six Gun and met a star, please mention it in the comments. I'd love to hear who else had been there. The famous were a great addition, but it was the regular performers that made Six Gun stand out among the other Florida attractions. At parks such as Parrot Jungle, Gatorland, and Sarasota Jungle Gardens, the stars of the shows were animals. Cypress Gardens had its thrilling water ski shows, but visitors didn't interact with the skiers the way they did with the residents of Six Gun. The park's main competitor would end up being Walt Disney World, which wouldn't open until 1971. Disney World's Frontierland and the Fort Wilderness Resort would end up providing similar entertainment, with the exception of gunfights. Six Gun Territory continued successfully up to the early 1970s. However, the opening of Disney World impacted every Florida attraction. Overnight, Disney became the number one attraction in the state. With a large and state-of-the-art theme park, as well as several resorts, its first year attendance was more than four times the attendance of Six Gun's best year. Through the 1970s, Six Gun struggled along, but with issues like the 1973 oil crisis, their attendance significantly dropped. Unlike a lot of Florida's attractions, the park was expensive to operate because of the number of staff needed to create the feeling of a bustling frontier town. Labor costs are always one of the largest expenses. On the other hand, it's likely that part of the park's decline had to do with the diminishing popularity of the Western theme. While there were 12 Westerns on TV when the park opened, 
there were none being produced by the end of the 70s. In response, the park would eventually shutter some of the shops and eventually even close a lot of the rides to save money. Not surprisingly, this also hurt attendance, and by the 1980s, the writing was on the wall. Six Gun Territory closed in 1984, just 21 years after it opened. As of 2021, the attraction's property is the home of a strip mall named Six Gun Plaza on Silver Springs Boulevard, just a few blocks west of the entrance of Silver Springs, itself much less than it was back in the 60s. Silver Springs survived as an attraction in 2013 when it was purchased by the state and converted into a state park. It was left with just the glass bottom boats operating, much as it had been a hundred years ago. Six Gun Territory disappeared into history like so many of Florida's attractions. If you ask some of the old crackers, they'll tell you that more attractions have closed in the state than were ever opened. You'll find Six Gun on internet lists of lost attractions, but it's hardly lost. I have dozens of postcards and brochures, and have talked to dozens of people who remember the park fondly. It's only based on incidental evidence, but for me, few attractions seem to hold as much nostalgia as does Six Gun. The good news is that much like the fellow in Monty Python and the Holy Grail who's not dead yet, Six Gun territory still survives. One of its fans found himself in a position to purchase parts of the old attraction and somehow keep Florida's Wild West spirit alive. Daryl and Tracy Kirby, who live in Williston, just under 30 miles northwest of the old six-gun property, decided to do something to help children in need. So a decade ago, the Kirbys bought 110 acres of land. On it, they began to develop a sort of educational farm for children and families. They were lucky enough to purchase one of the trains that was a six-gun territory original, and by December 2012, they held their first train event for family and friends, a Christmas train. The Kirby Family Farm quickly became a success, with thousands of kids being able to visit, free of charge, every year. But let's let Daryl Kirby describe it himself. So Kirby Family Farm is actually a 501c3 children's educational facility and we open to the public for special events like this one that you're here today to see. Um, the Kirby Family Farm, we, when we started the mission, our mission really was to just look for children who, whether it be medical, medical needs, foster care, uh, special needs, at-risk youth, you know, we just wanted to find the children, target the children who, you know, were struggling, you know, that, that had, you know, had little reason to smile. You know, our, our first goal with Kirby Family Farm, when we initiated the, you know, founded the organization, was to just try to put a kid on a smile's face that didn't have much to smile about. And that's now led to where we're teaching, we're growing, you know, we're building confidence, you know, helping children, you know, with academics and things. So we really didn't realize when we started, and I say we, my wife Tracy and I, when we started, we didn't realize how easy it would be to give them that smile. You would think that a kid who's been in foster care their whole life or a kid who's dealt with medical, you know, situation and operations after operations would be, you know, not a very happy kid, you know, for what, considering what they've been through. But what we found is they're so desperate for that joy or desperate for that moment that it was really much easier than we thought. I mean, you put a 10-year-old in a fire truck and say, hey, have you ever driven a fire truck? And they, of course, haven't. And now they're driving one. They got something to really be happy about. So we found out that our mission was much easier. It was just the opposite of what we thought. We thought it was going to be difficult, but it was actually much easier to accomplish. You know, and, and that led us to start working with the larger organizations like Make-A-Wish and Ronald McDonald House and different children's and family organizations and guidance counselors and things. And, you know, again, when we first founded Kirby Family Farm, we thought we would start about and just go 30 minutes out. You know, that would kind of get us going. And our very first group that came out as an outreach program came from, what was it, Winter Garden, which is almost two hours away. So we're like, well, that blows that theory. And today, our farthest family we've worked with was from Huron, Ohio, which is on the shores of Lake Erie. And our largest, our, our farthest group we've worked with came down from Atlanta, Georgia. So in a normal year, in a traditional year, when we're not having you know, the health precautions that we've all been dealing with, in a normal year, we host over 10,000 children. And that's at no cost. So the no cost began to be expensive for, you know, to run. It costs a lot to, you know, you, you know, to keep a 100-year-old 
locomotive and things going and now we have nine locomotives in our collection and several other train cars so how do we balance you know our mission that we do for free and pay those bills and keep everything going and expanding and growing as we find more needs and that's when we came up with uh, when we started with the Christmas train we said well instead of just begging for donations like so many good charities you know there's a lot of great causes and they have to just struggle 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 for finances and and it's always a struggle for us too but we had an opportunity a little different let's invite people out their contribution goes to a good cause and let's see what happens and that started with our Christmas train and now we host several events throughout the year not only do we host events for our charity but we host events for other charities because we do have a vehicle that can help not only what we're doing but other youth related programs you know our very first event of the year that we host our very first public event of the year in January is actually all the proceeds go to a, another charity you know and that's just it's just really enabled us to to do what we want to do and do more for others it's a remarkable story I've provided a link to their websites in the description as well as showing it here. The farm is a wonderful place with its train and station, western town, old carnival rides, many of which are in working order, and, interestingly, a long line of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus rail cars. These cars will be featured in an upcoming video on Florida's many tourism connections with the circus. As for how the Kirbys are keeping six-gun territory alive, let's go back to Daryl Kirby and his childhood. My apologies for the sound in part of this video. It seems that the Tracy Lynn wanted to be heard as it was passing through town. <laughs> um, so six-gun territory is kind of cool because when I was a kid, um, I got to go to my to, to six-gun territory with a friend of my mother. She used to take me and. Um, I'd have a great time. And I remember going one time as a little boy with my family and it was packed. Those porches were just full of people and, and I was sitting by other kids and we were watching the gunfights and all and it was packed. And I just, that's really the only memory I have of that. But then as I grew older, you know, the park, you know, the Disney World was thriving and different things. And, and we had gone from Wild West shows to Star Wars and Star Trek and movies and, you know, TV shows. So we went from some from Wild West to sci-fi. So there are so many factors, I think, that took, you know, took the, the lure and love of the Old West away from us. So when we would go with this friend of my mom, she couldn't have children, and so my mom would just let her take me and pretend I was hers whenever, you know, and um, so we would go to Six Gun, and I remember sometimes on a Sunday afternoon, there would only be a few cars in the parking lot. And as I look back on that now, it's, it's devastating because if I had realized as a kid, that was the beginning to the end. But for me as a child at the time, that was my favorite memories because they didn't mind if you threw yourself in the dirt like you got shot to or the gravel and played. So it, it played a part. You know, my childhood was had its rough spots and it, and it played a part as, you know, it gave me one of those smiles that we like to give kids today. So back to, you know, our charity and our outreach and all where we started doing things. One of the things that we wanted to do was a Wild West weekend, and I said, I want to do it in honor of Six Gun Territory. But we had basically, I guess you could say, put it on the shelf, um, kind of, you know, we didn't want to do it because today's a, it's a different world than, you know, back then. So, and I, I didn't feel confident that I could have the safety precautions and all in place. Well, some couple years goes by and we get a cold call to our general, general inbox and a gentleman had reached out to us about wanting to do a Wild West show that they do. They are Wild West reenactors and they go and rob trains and train museums and all and do a train robbery and then all the money they rob goes to charity. Well, they said, hey, you got your own train. Can we come rob your train? And so we talked about it and we, we you know, changed a few things from their original model. But I told them about Six Gun Territory. Of course, a lot of them had remembered going as a kid, so they're all excited. So we went and we... event and there were so many thousands of people that showed up that the guys wanted to make it an annual event and they just kept coming so then they said well let's make it biannual and they kept coming so now we actually do the event three times a year and um, it's, it's a significant you know it's a, it's a, it makes a very big impact financially for the charity and um, and it's also another avenue where we can incorporate some of the kids they get to volunteer and help with the rides help with different things but yeah, Six Gun Territory, you know, for me as a kid, 
wow, you know, it, 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 you know, it definitely played, it made an impact, you know, uh, growing up, got, kept my mind off a few things, you know, I would get the option of going, um, you know, I could pick one, Six Gun or Disney or one of the other parks, and I would always pick Six Gun, you know, it just meant so much to me, so to be there, I remember the very first Six Gun, and looking at so many of the original gunfighters and everything out here, and I'm like, this is like having my childhood action figures literally playing with me in my backyard, you know, and, and we've, I, I know the guys and the gals and everybody who's worked at Six, the original Six Gun that have come out and helped embrace this, and because we can't replicate the original, um, but we can sure remember it, and we've made a lot of good new memories, and we have so much more. You know, we do have the original train station, you know, it was, you know, the only building that was that survived when they bulldozed Six Gun Territory was the back train station. And we have that here that was donated to us and it's being restored. And so we have that. We have three of the four locomotives. It's probably obvious that Daryl was speaking during one of the Six Gun Territory weekends, as you can also hear gunshots in the background. Those would have been robbers trying to steal gold from the train. I've been lucky enough to attend two of the Six Gun Weekends and wanted to go more often, but it's complicated considering all the other places I want to go. Regardless, the events are a lot of fun. No, it's not equal to the original attraction itself. The Kirby Farm has the train and several more locomotives, a much smaller town, only a few rides, and vendors that sell food and Western-themed gifts and toys. The staff are volunteers. Remember, these weekends are designed to be fundraisers for the charity work with kids in need. There's gunfights, and robbers rob the train. There's can-can dancing, singing, and other performances as well. One of the best parts is there are original performers from Six Gun Territory at each event, most of which are performing, and all of which are happy to talk with visitors about all things Six Gun. Here's a short gunfight now. Wow, it looks as if those outlaws got it right here in Six Gun. Colorado made it around the corner and got out of here. The Kirby Family Farm does a great job with their events, which also include the Christmas Train, Halloween Scary Train, Rock and Roll Easter Train, Jeep Toberfest, and Weird Beard Festival. Not surprisingly, the events are especially great for kids, and there's lots of activities to keep people entertained throughout the day. I would definitely encourage people to visit. Of course, one of their most important roles after helping thousands of children is to keep the memory of Six Gun Territory alive. While it only operated for 21 years, it was an engaging attraction, and it was unique in Florida. Thanks for watching another of my videos. If you enjoyed it, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.